Welcome to After Hours Engineering, Episode 16, Risk 5 Softcore. In a previous episode, we implemented CSRs and created a few programs to highlight their functionality. In this episode, we close out the simulation path by running the same program we did in the previous episode, but this time we run it in our NCURSES uh, console with a few modifications. This gives us a chance to see how random interrupts can control and influence the flow of control via trap handlers. And lastly, we'll begin our final goal, which is synthesis. And we'll use Volcanology's Black Ice uh, ecosystem, the new one, called the Black Edge. So, let's go. In the previous episode, we viewed a simple yet hard-coded interrupt program using GTK Wave. However, this time we will review our code in NCURSES. So I spent a bit of time coding up a very basic two-pass regular expression assembler, and this is the assembly code that we will run in our simulation. So let's take a look at this first. This is nearly identical to the one we did in GTK Wave, but I've added a little feature in here where while we were in our loop, we should see the X3 register increment continuously until an interrupt occurs and then we increment X5. So every time an interrupt occurs, X5 is going to increment. Otherwise, X3 is continuously incrementing. This is the assembler code for it. You'll notice there's no machine code in here. This looks roughly similar to an assembly file. Uh, it isn't compliant RISC 5 for the most part. It is using the actual mnemonics, but there are some oddities in here that I threw in. This is just something quick and fast that I could do for this video series. We have load words, we can interpret jump in the links, the CSR registers, and the M return, and we can embed data sections within it. So we'll go over this real quick. We just do a couple of starters. We set up the counters. We set up to enable global interrupts using our CSR instruction from down here. This is our mask. We then go into a loop and we go around and around and around incrementing X3 until an interrupt occurs. Now before the program starts up and starts in main, it comes down here and it loads the reset vector for the boot address which is here at 10, which is address 40 in the code. And over to the right is the assembled code for that. Here's address 10 with those uh, particular instructions that are in them. And you can, the easiest ones to spot are the break instructions right here at 6. So it goes ahead and disables global interrupts. Then we load in our MTV VEC base address and then finally enable the modes, just like we did in the GTK Wave version. And then we jump to main and set up and enable global interrupts and begin counting. Let's go ahead and launch the console and take a look at that code running within the simulations. There we are, we've got to load it up. I'm going to go ahead and load in the code here. And let's take a look at the registers up here. You'll notice that none of them are set. And this code down here, remember in the code, is going to go ahead and set up and enable certain bits in these registers. Also, we'll want to pay attention to the EPC register. That's where we will jump. And of course, our empty vec is going to get loaded with the trap vector itself, which is farther down here. If I scroll down, you can see right here is the trap vector itself. So let's go ahead and change our delay time to 10, slow it down a little bit, and we'll start the program running. As you can see here, there it goes. It's now running through our boot program right here. And watch the various registers they'll get set up here. This one is going to get set here real quick. There went MIE and that it was set. And so now we're coming down into the loop right here. This is where we're going to go around and around a loop. So if we come over here and look at X3, you can see that it's counting up. X5 is our interrupt trap handler and it'll count every time we hit the home key. So if you'll see over here, we're doing fetches, we're running and executing the instructions, we're going around and around. Now I'm going to go ahead and slow down the clock a little bit more so that we can really see the interrupt. So now it's really slow. We can see each one of the instruction states as it goes through its fetch. So I'm going to hit the home key and watch 
the uh, instruction down here and also watch the MEPC. It'll suddenly load with the interrupt. So here I'm going to hit the key. There I go. I just hit the interrupt. And so it's running through where it interrupted and there it went. It just loaded the address of where it's going to return to. And there's our uh, trap vector and it's gone down. I'll scroll down so we can see it. There it is. It's going through the uh, instructions and there it is. It's now back up. It ran and it incremented x5 to 1. Excellent. So now it's back up there looping. And I'm going to hit the interrupt again. There it goes. There's the interrupt got hit. And this time you can see that it's going through our IRQs. It's running the trap vector. Now watch this turn into prefetch. Then it'll load in the MRET. There it goes. And then there's the last of the MRET which sends it back up to the top. So our interrupt is doing exactly what we expect it to be doing, perfect. Now I'm going to go ahead and speed up the code, uh, take off the delay here, so now it's really running. And you can see that X3 is counting really fast. So every time I hit the, X, the home key, it's going to increment this by one. And the trap is a really short trap routine, so it can happen really fast. Here I go. See how fast it is? It's barely blinking down there at the bottom, and I'm counting through. So there you go. The interrupt code is working. It's working in the simulation and you can slow it down and see what traps. Watch what happens in the MEPC as I hit the home button. You can see it changes to 10 and 14 depending on where I'm luck, you know, getting lucky and hitting either the interrupting on the 4 or on the 5. Uh, and that's how it works. So yes, it's all working. Perfect. Okay, so before we move on to the synthesis portion of that, we're almost done, we're pretty much are done with the simulation side. I wanted to share with you something that I had found while I was recording this episode. The previous segment that you just watched um, had a bug in it, and that is when I hit the interrupt. Now, I recorded that episode with the fix in it, but in reality, there was a bug. And every time I would hit the home button, or generate an interrupt signal. For example, just after the JAL instruction where the e-brake was, it would actually store the e-brake and not the JAL. And when I slowed the clock down and started looking at things, I noticed that it was jumping right into the prefetch cycle. And I was like, that's not right. This is a serious bug in this thing. And what I discovered, and it dawned on me, was is that I had inadvertently had this line right here. And this is ne not necessarily bad, as you'll see here in a moment. The problem is, is that these two signals are not are asynchronous to each other, and they're not part of the same domain. Uh, this clock does not expect an interrupt to trigger uh, activity within this clock domain here. And so this is not really a good idea. It's a generally a bad idea to mix signals in the same clock domain. And later on down the road, when I do a segment on SPY, you'll see just how catastrophic that can be. So, But in the meantime, I took the interrupt out and I moved it down here into its own domain. And as you'll see, that there actually is two signals down here. But these two signals are part of the same domain. They belong together. And the way this works is, is that when an interrupt goes low and we don't have one that's pending, we go ahead and set that pending bit. So if we come up here inside of our flip-flop cycle in this clock domain, you notice that this domain is looking for that pending flag. As soon as it sees it, it sets its internal pending bit and then responds by setting the reset. So if we come back down here, you can see that, ah, this domain now sees that the pending reset has gone and it goes ahead and clears that pending bit out. So we have effectively sent a communication, we've established a communication between the two clock domains using these two signals. One is a signal from what the clock over to the interrupt request domain and the other one is a signal over to the clock domain. So effectively this creates a one bit, one depth level FIFO queue that the two domains talk with and this fixed the problem. So it was definitely my mistake to introduce this. This was not a good idea. This is a bad idea to mix two signals that are in disparate clock domains. So that's how it works. If we come up here to the 
prefetch cycle now, you can see that we are looking at the pending flag, which is looking at that um, pending bit. And we're also looking at another bit here, or another signal, the interrupt request. So if we come down here, we'll see that the when the, there's a pending bit and there's no interrupt in progress, we go ahead and we set that progress flag. Now this is a guard flag to keep the prefetch from being repeatedly entered while instructions say within the trap routine are running. We don't want that to happen. So we need to guard from actually entering into the interrupt flow again. Uh, we only want to enter it once to get us into the trap routine and then not again until we've exited the MRET instruction. So if we come up here to the MRET instruction, we saw it run in a simulation. You can see that the last thing it does is it clears out the uh, status register. It re-enables the global interrupts. And that's exactly what we expect. So I just wanted to share this with you real quick, a little bit on inadvertently mixing signals between clock domains and how it can really make troubleshooting really difficult. Uh, so, but the solution is, is to break them up into their own domains and then use signaling mechanisms to have the two clock domains uh, talk to each other. So without further ado, let's get on to synthesis. With our ISA and minimal implementation of CSRs complete, we're ready for the synthesis phase. Of course, when you reach synthesis, you most certainly have a target in mind. In our case, we have Volcanology's new Black Edge, or Black Ice NXT, plus the Ice Logic bus. Now down here on the bottom, we have the Ice Logic bus, which contains the uh, lattice ice chip and a few connectors on it, and then a two bars right here, two buses. These connect up here to the Black Ice NXT, which also has the STM controller and some hyperflash and RAM with all the blades and an FPC connector and a few other connectors here and there. Uh, you also get a tile here, it's a seven segment. Down here is the VGA. And over right here is some PMOD connectors. So let's go over here and take a look at the Black Ice NXT. You can see that it has the STM on it. It's a, a moderately sized uh, microcontroller, but it's it's pretty powerful in and of itself. The Hyper RAM and Hyper Flash, some storage, the crystals, and various other things, the micro blades that we'll be interfacing with here in a moment, and a status LED, and a few other things. The Ice Logic bus that has the ice chip on it. Uh, some more status LEDs, some tiles, and the backplane, and some a lot of uh, FPGA IOs. So this is what we're going to use with it. Now I can show you a logic diagram uh, in a minute here that will lay out how the two kind of relate to each other. But let's jump right into the Blinky because that's what we like to do is play with the Blinky. So here we are at the ubiquitous Blinky. And as you can see, it's a module with one input, the clock from the board itself, that's a 25 megahertz, and then an output to the LED, the LED. Uh, this is a ubiquitous blinky example. Here we have a counter, and we pick off the bit 22 to drive the LED, and we have a little counter here that counts around in a circle, and that will cause the LED to blink. But what is this LED? So we'll need to go over to the top module, the top module is usually our interface over to the hardware world and again we are getting a clock on the hardware and we're outputting a signal to the LED pin. Uh, there's our module, we bind our two inputs to the uh, pins here on the top module. So ultimately what is that LED? Well like any FPJ there is a PCF file that comes along with it and Black Edge is no exception. LED is defined as J11 and if you were to open up the schematics you'd find that this is where that LED right here has been routed to. So the make file you've seen several times before, we have our Yosis command that runs the synthesis ICE40, runs, uh, sets up a couple of parameters, some outputs, and specifies a default top file. Nothing's really changed between anything that we've done on our previous episode for uploading things to an FPGA. Uh, however, this time when we plug in the hardware, it's going to show up on TTY ACM0 on a Linux box. We of course have to include our pin constraints file. And the first thing we'll do in order to build all this is to call the build, then route, and then upload. 
and build is naturally going to call Yosis to get it all done. Then it's going to call next PNR to get all the routing done. And we have to tell it uh, some information at this point. Once you get down to the routing stage, you really have to start telling it uh, what you're dealing with here. And in this case, we're dealing with that ICE 40, which is a BGA 121. This, this helps it out, knows how the physical chip is built and packaged. And then finally, we go to the upload. And in this case, we're going to use the ice pack feature of the um, ice storm tool chain. And it will pack it all up. And then all we have to do with the black edge is just set the uh, TTY port to raw and then literally cat the binary file over to um, the target port. And that's it. The target port being that TTY ACM0. So at this point, we're ready to give it a shot. Okay, we're ready to run blinky blink. Uh, at this point, I'm at the console here and I've got my make set up. And what you'll need to do is pay attention to this area right down here. There's a little LED on the uh, logic bus and it will start blinking as soon as I run the make command. It'll build it, compile it, and then upload it. You ready? Here we go. There we go. It just ran through all three of those commands, built, uh, ran Yosis, next PNR, and then uploaded the binary stream, the bit stream, up to the FPGA. And there you go. We have Blinky running. So we are on our way to doing synthesis. We got a little bit to do, and we're going to have a little bit more fun. The next thing I want to play around with is this card right down here. The uh, Remember when I talked about the blades? Well, we have a blade that came with it that has seven LEDs, and I'm going to plug it right into this blade slot right up underneath the card here, and we'll take a look at some more fancier uh, demonstrations of some of the targets, and then we'll take a look at the seven segment display. So we'll take it up a notch, and we're going to run the blade blinky. In order to do that, we're going to use this little chip right here, this little blade, actually if I can get my fingers on it, and it plugs into a little slot over here to the side, and we'll do that in a second. Let's take a look at the code right here. Uh, we have our usual clock coming in. We have that LED that for most of my simulations you're going to see that, our synthesis, you're going to see this LED in there, and that tells me that for me that it's uploaded, so you should always see the blue blinking light. And then we have this blade over here. So what is that blade? That blade is defined right here. And if we scroll up to the top, we can get to that blade definition right here. So there it is. That's blade one, and you can see that there are six entries to this array. We'll come back here, and this is what we're going to target in our uh, system Verilog code. And there you go. We got blade. If we want to see what it actually is, it's actually blade one. I just simply called it blade in the Blinky module itself. We take each one of the counter bits, instead of picking off just bit 22, we're now picking off all six of these here and routing to the blade. So we should see, uh, I believe they're red, green, and orange is in here. I think it's red, orange, and green. So that's what we're going to see on the blade when I plug it in. So let's give this a shot. We're going to go ahead and compile it and send it out there. So I'm, I haven't brought up the console, but I'm typing it right now. There it goes. And now you can see that the blinky is over here, but we're not seeing our blade because we need to plug it in. So let's go ahead and plug it in right here on the side. It'll light up a bit as I'm plugging it in. And I'm going to cover it up a little bit so we can see the LEDs on it. And there you go. We have the blinky blade running on the uh, Black Edge NXT. Awesome, the Black Edge in this case. So, now it's time to look at the seven segments. and We're going to try that next. Okay, now it's time to step it up one more notch and have fun with the seven segments display. So, I've loaded up the seven segments code out of the synthesis folder here. And it's built out of a few modules. It's a bit more complicated, but not by much. We have our usual clocks coming in the LED for our heartbeat uh, blade just to have some fun blinky bits counting along with the counter itself and then the tile. This tile is actually defined up here at the top and it's tile one. You can have there's uh, several four tiles that you can plug into and you can move your tiles around. I have my seven segment plugged into this tile right here. So if we come down to the picture 
that's this one right here. Now you would have to take this this picture right here and rotate it 180 degrees so that my tile shows up in the image that we're seeing down here in the, the uh, video on the lower right. So let's take a look at the code some more here. We have our digits that we're going to count with. These will be routed to the segment, seven segment module. We'll take a look at that in a second. And we have a counter that we can adjust the counting rate on. That's why this counter is a little bit more fancy than the other counters. And you can adjust the how fast it counts. Uh, and then this segment section right here breaks the digital uh, counter down into its segments on each one and you can do that using the modular operator with the division. So let's take a look at the seven segment here. All it does is it scans the um, scanner. Those seven segments are all connected through a common, I think it's common anode. And so this is switching this bit right here, each one of these bits as they go low activates that segment on there. And if you run around in circles fast enough it, as usual it makes it look as if it's all three of them are on at the same exact time and we route each one of the segments uh, out to the tile so where are these segments coming from they're coming from a decoder so this is your typical giant switch or case statement in this instance where whatever BCD value is coming in we convert it to which one of the sub-segments of a segment that gets lit on. Anything that's a zero turns them all on. So for a zero we want to turn all of these edges right here on and that's all this thing does. It's just one giant case statement. So we can control the scanning rate and we'll do that in a moment and we'll also control the counting uh, rate up top right here, the counting rate. So let's get this thing loaded up onto the uh, board itself so I'll type make and get it loaded over there it goes and now it's counting yay and you can see the blade uh, right here is also counting as well so uh, that's what we're gonna do so let's go ahead and play around we'll adjust the uh, counting rate up here we'll change this down to say uh, 11 and then we'll rerun the make file and upload it and you'll see that it's counting extremely fast. So that's that's too fast. The smaller the number, the faster it counts. So we'll change that to 31 and see what that does. So we'll load up the make. And now you can see that it isn't counting at all because our counter is maximum. So let's bring it back down, set it to 22, and run make again. And now you can see it's counting a little bit slower. And our counter is of size 30 so we'll actually we'll just go one more digit up and it'll count a little bit slower all right excellent so let's mess around with that scanning rate we'll drop this we'll raise this up to like 25 I believe that if I'm correct when I wrote this thing yeah so you can see that it's not scanning very fast right now I've exceeded the scanner on it we'll take that down a little bit more bring the scanner up so there there you go that's scanning at a slow rate. As you can see, we're missing digits. It's scanning so slow that we're actually missing digits. So we'll need to speed it up a bit. So we'll drop that number down a little bit more, speed it up, re-upload it to the board, and there it goes. Now it's scanning faster. So the video camera that I'm using will pick up the slow scan rate. And then we'll bring it back up to uh, 18. Let's try uh, 20. Uh, 15. That's that's a pretty fast scanning rate. You won't see anything. It'll look solid as a rock. So I chose 18 to give it a little bit of a scan. We could probably do 20 so that it flickers a bit. That's always a fun effect. And there it goes. So it's flickering. The camera is bare. It's picking up the intermittent um, segments here. If I drop it down to 19, it'll just be right on the edge. There you go. It's you can see it. It's flickering and uh, wavy a little bit there, but that's right on the edge. So there you go. This is the Black Ice Edge with the NXT and the Ice Logic Bus. There you go. We have just started the synthesis stage. I had mentioned earlier about a diagram that kind of lays out a logical representation of the hardware itself. And of course, we have the two pieces of hardware, the two main pieces of hardware, which is the Ice Logic Bus and the Black Ice NXT. 
The NXT has the STM controller on it, and in it, the Black Crab will take your data that we've been uploading via the TTY, the ACM0 port, and upload it via that right onto the FPGA on the Ice Logic bus. There, you could put anything you want on it, of course, your soft cores. There is a utility that Focanology and Lori has written to make it easy to move data to and from anything you might have on your FPGA. In most cases, it might be a soft core, uh, a gateway or controller to talk to the hyper chips that are on there. We have the uh, blades that are here. And then on the STM, you have the place where the bitstream is stored for power up, the clocks, the SD card, uh, debug header, and then a bunch of pins that drive and provide like clock and reset to the ICE logic bus. So this is an overall picture. It's It will change over time as I learn more about the device and get information from Focanology. But I just wanted to show you this up front, that this is the ecosystem of the Black Edge and how it's kind of fleshing out. Excellent. We made it to synthesis. And as you may be wondering now, it really isn't about the RISC-V ISA any longer, but more about what we can do with our soft core processor. And probably the biggest issue that we'll have is communicating with the outside world. We, we lack that ability. Now communications is typically done via some sort of a bus along with a protocol. For example, SPY or UART. In the next episode, we'll begin looking at SPY protocol and how we can transfer information into and out of an FPGA. And after that, we'll look at UART and how we can use it via a text I.O. communications program like Minicom. These protocols will come in handy, especially UART, when communicating with Ranger Risk. And finally, uh, I've recently started a new job and it's quite uh, busy onboarding to the new job and it's taking up a fair bit of my time. And I really like doing these videos, but I can't do them as quick as I did them before. So there may be a gap or two, but I'll try to keep that at a minimum uh, because I, I know at least 308 of you like the videos and you watch them quite often. So I'm gonna keep at it, it just might not be as often as I would like it to be. So uh, I just ask for you to be patient and uh, until next time, peace. Mm -hmm.